In March of this year, I celebrated my 85th birthday. So I'm really old. Uh, that's a lot of candles on a cake, more than I could blow out. Uh, it's many, many days. I Googled it, and I actually, in March, had lived 31,025 days. That's a lot of days to, to have lived. And on my birthday, I decided to Google to see if I could come up with any cute things to say about turning 85 so I could post it on my media post. And there's nothing on Google that's cute about 85. <laughs> Most of the words were frail, uh, needy. I hated this one, waiting to die. I hated that. I hated that. So I decided to delete Google and to uh, Google God. That's a better one to Google when you need information. And, and this is true. I prayed on my 85th birthday. And I said, Lord, I don't know how much time I have left, but I want you to speak to me on my 85th birthday about my life. And the way God and I normally communicate is through scripture. It's been the, a course of my life since I first became a Christian. And God gave me a scripture, Psalm 71. I'm going to read verses 17 and 18. It was very personal to me. If God had spoken personally, it could not have been any more powerful. And in Psalm 71, verse 18, this is what God said to me, or rather what I said to God. You have taught me from my youth, and hitherto, up until now, I have declared your wondrous words. Now when I'm old and gray-headed, forsake me not until I have shown your strength to this generation and your power to everyone that is to come. And it was a very personal scripture because I have known God from my youth. I was born again at age 15, and God and I have been together since age 15. I have declared the wondrous works of God. When I was about 31 or 32 years old, I began to minister was called into full-time ministry with my husband at age 37. And for 54 years, my life has been about declaring the wondrous works of God. And now, I am old. God just tells the truth. He doesn't try to pretty it up or make me feel better about it. I am old as Mark said, really old. And in spite of appearances, I'm gray-headed. The Bible tells you to look at unseen things, not things you can see. <laughs> and the unseen is true. I am gray-headed. And here I am, an old gray-headed woman, and I have achieved something that God wants all of us to achieve, which is longevity with God. Uh, doing life with God. I find there are a lot of born-again Christians that don't have the testimony of longevity. A lot of born-again Christians that never know how to do life with God. And I have achieved, by the grace and mercy of God, Longevity. Longevity means to last a long time. And the longevity I'm going to speak about today is not length of years, but rather it is able to do life with God. Amen. And I have done life with God for 70 years. I have been in ministry for 54 years and have been married to the same man for 65 years. So I have a testimony of longevity this morning. I'm able to testify in a way that a 20-year-old cannot testify. 
This is why God speaks in that scripture. From your youth until you're old and gray-headed. And God gave me a, an assignment on my 85th birthday. And it was that I was to show the strength of God to this generation. And I was to show his power to all of those who are to come. And that is the strength and the power of longevity. A friend introduced me at a conference, and this is the way the introduction began. I don't know when I first met June Evans, but she's been around a long time. And I have been here 34 years. So I come to you this morning with a testimony of longevity. And there is a strength and a power to longevity. And the strength and the power of longevity is endurance. The biblical word that you'll read quite often is the word patience. But we're going to allow uh, me to use the word endurance. They, they both mean the same thing. And I have done life with God. I have been able to have the testimony that God and I have walked together for 70 years because I, I have endured. The strength and the power of longevity is endurance. We must endure uh, unto the end. We were uh, eating in a restaurant, and the server was this little guy in his 20s, and he said to Jeannie and me, he said, uh, I've been married for two months. And he said, you all look like you may have been married a long time. And we said, we have been married a long time. We've been married 65 years. And he said, well, tell me the secret to being married a long time. And I knew he was wanting us to say, oh, we go out on dates. He brings me flowers. And my answer was, I have endured. <laughs> I have endured. This is the reason old people cry at weddings. We're not crying out of romance. We know what's ahead. <laughs> and we cry for you poor things that are just getting married. We know what's ahead. And even though Gene is wonderful, I have endured him. That's how... <laughs> we have married, and he has endured me, and that's the secret to longevity. Now, when I talk about endurance, I'm not speaking about the way the world endures. You know, the world kind of endures thinking it's hanging by your fingernails, you're desperate, you're about to go under, you don't know if you can keep holding on. This is not what I'm speaking of because the Bible scripture that we read tells us that endurance is a strength and a power. It is a God-given strength and power. And God gives that strength and power so that we can do life with God. And endurance does not mean to hang by your fingernails. Endurance means... To, to stay in, in the course so God can finish what he has begun. Amen. So I want us to think of endurance as finishing. God wants us to be finishers. And a lot of Christians begin well and they finish very, very fo foolishly. If we think about endurance in the biblical concept... Uh, God presents it to us as a marathon race. And in the race of the marathon, the marathon runner runs 26 miles. I think it's 365 yards. And the goal of the marathon is not necessarily to be the first one that crosses the finish line. The goal of the marathon is to finish. And when people finish, they are honored. Uh, there is the 100-meter dash, which is a race, but in the 100-meter dash, I think the world record is nine seconds. 
very quick. And there are a lot of Christians that are dashers. They start very well, but they don't know how to finish. They don't know how to come to the finish line with God. So when we talk about endurance and longevity, I want us to think of it within the context of a, a power and a strength that enables us to run for the finish in life. God, who has begun a good work in us, wants to finish it. And we have to be there at the finish line. James chapter 1, verse 4, says this. Let endurance have her perfect work. So God defines endurance as a perfect work. And that word perfect means to come to the end, to be complete. Endurance is given to us so God can get to the end of all he wants to do, so God can, can finish what he has begun. Let endurance have her perfect work that you may be perfect, entire, wanting nothing. Now that does not mean that we're superhuman people. The word perfect means goal attained. The word entire means all has been done that should have been done. And the word wanting nothing means that nothing has been left out. So I can give a testimony today that I have done life with God for 70 years. And in a moment, we'll find out it doesn't always go well. But God and I have hung together. And so far as I know, at age 85... I have attained the goals God has set for me. So far as I know, all has been done that should have been done. And as far as I know, nothing has been left out. Now that's where God wants every one of us to be. That's where God wants to take every one of us. So endurance is this work that enables us to uh, continue. You remember Jesus on the cross. The next to the last word that he uttered was, it is finished. And when he said that, he did not mean that he, you know, was through hanging on the cross. It was a very powerful uh, prophetic word, meaning that the goal had been attained, all had been done that should have been done, and nothing has been left out or wanting. That is Calvary. That is the work of Calvary. It is finished. The Apostle Paul wrote his last epistle from a Roman prison. He's waiting to have his head cut off by the Roman government, and he wrote to his spiritual son, Timothy, I have finished my course. And that is not a word of death. It, it was a word of praise to God. That what God intended that man to do in his life, he had attained those goals. That everything he should have done had been done. And he had left nothing out and nothing wanting. And that's where endurance will take us. That's where God wants to take us. Now, the thing about endurance is it's very personal. I cannot endure for you, and you cannot endure for me. It is a very, very personal thing. And everyone in the room has that responsibility before God. Not even God can endure for you. The Bible says you've got to let this strength and power of endurance work. You have to uh, work with it. Uh, I heard um, Coach Nick Saban, this was years ago, give a testimony about one of his teams. And the person who was uh, talking to him about that Alabama team that year wanted to know why that team did not uh, achieve the national championship. 
And I'm just going to paraphrase what Coach Saban said, but it went to my heart. He said, well, uh, the, the problem with, with this team is they could never play a complete game in a hostile environment. He said they could start very well, but they were never able to complete the game in a hostile environment. And he said in football, you have to be able to play the fourth quarter, which is the last 15 minutes of football. And I wrote in the flyleaf of my Bible, I go back and read it every now and then, that I, June Evans, with the help of the Holy Spirit, am going to live a complete life with goals attained, nothing left out or wanting, all done that should have been done. A finisher. A finisher. God wants us to be finishers. Now, we have to let endurance work, and there is a warfare with endurance. And uh, it, it may be a surprise to you, but the warfare is not with people. The warfare is not with the devil. The warfare concerns your personal relationship with God. Because endurance is going to take you a distance. And endurance has to be lived with God. And in, in this life of endurance, it requires each of us making a long-term commitment to God Amen. because we're going to have to journey with the Lord. And the warfare uh, really boils down to your relationship with God, what you think about God, how you're going to handle God through the years of your lives. And that's what endurance is given to us for. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14 says, For we are made partakers, that means to participate in, we are made partakers of Christ if, and I always say the two biggest words in the Bible are if, and every time you see one you need to circle it, if, meaning it depends on us, if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So God has a beginning, God has the end, and our responsibility is to hold steadfast to our commitment to Almighty God. Now, as an 85-year-old woman, I can testify it's hard to hold fast unto the end. I know I look cute this morning, but I'm sprayed up, painted up, lifted up, and when I go home and put on sweats, everything falls to the floor. <laughs> Nothing's cute and steadfast. Uh, my granddaughter said, what is this grandmother? I said, it's my turkey neck. I said, God gives you turkey necks. She said, well, I have one. I said, yes, you're going to get a turkey neck. And God blesses you by giving you bat wings to praise the Lord during praise and worship. That's why I cover my arms. You don't want to see my bat wings. It's hard. It's hard to hold fast unto the end. Hebrews 10.35. Now listen to this. Don't let it go over your heads. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Who would throw away their confidence in God? A lot of people. <laughs> A lot of people. Because in this journey, what has to hold steadfast is your confidence in God. Don't cast away your confidence in God, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So we have to hold steadfast. This is the warfare uh, of endurance. There's a story in Mark chapter 4. Time won't permit us to study it in detail. Jesus had preached on 
one side of the Sea of Galilee, and he was going to take his disciples to the other side of, of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus makes this statement to them. He said, let us go to the other side. And I want you to know in life that life lived with God is a journey. And you're going to journey with God. A God who does beyond what you think. A God who does beyond what you can ask. A God who is unseen whose voice is often not heard. And you have to learn to journey with that. And in that journey, God is going to take you to the other side. And life has other sides. The good news today is it does not matter where you are today, there's another side of coming in tomorrow. And you've got to endure through today to get to the other side. When Jean and I got married, you know, we dated six months, we married. And we were students at the University of Alabama. And it was the day after our wedding. We spent our wedding night in our little apartment in Tuscaloosa because we were students. And, uh, you know, Jean wakes up, I wake up. Jean said, darling, I would like you to cook me two eggs overnight for breakfast. Now what Jean didn't know is Darlin didn't know how to cook. <laughs> because we had never discussed this on our dates. <laughs> that was not what we discussed, eggs overnight. And I gave him burnt scrambled eggs. The second day, Jean woke up and he said, honey, Today, I want eggs over light for breakfast. And honey gave him burnt scrambled eggs. The third day, Jean woke up and said, June, I want eggs over light. And June gave him burnt scrambled eggs. And on the fourth day, Jean said to me, what does a man have to do to get eggs over light? I said, you have to cook them yourself. You think I married you to cook your eggs the rest of my life? I'm going to college. I don't have time to get out of bed and cook your eggs over life. Four days into marriage. And I'm glad to report there's, there's another side to that story. We found the answer. When Jean says, darling, I want eggs over life, we go to Cracker Barrel. Praise God. <laughs> We just floated right over to the other side. He doesn't even argue about it anymore. We just go to Cracker Barrel, Waffle House. Somebody else cooks them for us. See, there's another side to your life. And you have to hang in there to get there. You have to endure because God is taking us to the other side. Now, in that story of going to the other side... Jesus went to the back of the boat that was going to take them across the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus went to sleep. I assume he was tired. In that journey, there was a storm, and the uh, disciples are battling for their lives. The Bible says the water was filling up the boat, so I just have a vision of those disciples throwing water out of the boat. And in that journey, you encounter storms, and the problem the disciples had was not with the storm, it was with Jesus. And Jesus is asleep on the back of the boat, and they said to Jesus, do you not care that we're about to die? They lost confidence. And their question about endurance is, are you not even involved? Uh, are, you, are you not caring? And that story ends with them saying, what kind of man is this that's on our boat? And you have to understand this. Jesus is on our boats today. Aren't you blessed that Jesus is on the boat? Now, Jesus is not a chit-chatter. Sometimes one word has to take you a long distance. 
But if you've heard from Jesus, one word will take you a long distance. One word will do it. And sometimes uh, Jesus seems to be slow. It seems as if he's not listening. We can pray the same prayers over and over and over again. And he says nothing. Uh, life doesn't change seemingly. Uh, it seems like we've been praying this forever and forever and forever. And in those times, you have to hold fast. You have to understand whether he talks or whether he moves quickly. Jesus is on your boat today. Amen. Jesus is on your boat. He's committed to the journey. You know, the thing that irritates me about Gene, he's not a chit-chatter. Gene doesn't use a lot of words. And Gene has this ability to talk without moving his lips. So I'll say to him, what kind of day have you had? Fine. Anything go on? Uh-uh. Did you talk to anybody? No. Anything interesting? Not much. So I told him real early in our marriage, I said, Gene, if you're going to live with me, you have to use words that require you to move your lips. Move your lips when you talk. Give me details when you talk. How many of you have ever wanted to say to God, I need you to move your lips this morning? Have you ever had a morning like that? I need you to give me some details this morning. That's when we have to learn to endure. And dear people, that, that is the issue of endurance. I don't have time this morning, but I've lived 70 years with God. And I've had to go long times with, with silence. I, I've had to go a long time giving God space to work because he works in fullness of time. He's trying to attain a goal. He's not a quick fix God. He, he does do instant miracles. But that's not the course of life. Most of us have, you know, some of you maybe have never seen an instant miracle. I have. I've been involved in two resurrections from the dead, and I've seen a third resurrection from the dead. But I'm, that's after 70 years. I had to learn to maintain confidence in God. And we have to know how to appreciate uh, the victory of endurance, yes. the, uh, the testimony, the power of endurance. Because if, if God is not a quick fix God, we have to learn to define victory differently. Because for most of us, victory is this explosive thing that happens. And we say, thank God, my prayer was answered. Thank God he did this. And that is victory. But dear people, sometimes victories, getting out of bed and putting your clothes on yes. and going to work, sometimes that's victory. And we have to learn to redefine victory. Psalm 84, I'm not going to read all of these verses, verses 5 through 7, says, Blessed is the person whose strength is in you, God, and whose heart are the ways now listen to this, who passing through the valley of weeping, the place of tears, make it a well, and then it ends, they go from strength to strength. So God is very honest with us that in this journey called life, we meet those places of weeping, and everybody in the rooms cried. Everybody in the room knows what that feels like. Everybody in the room has, has those times when life just turns upside down. It's negative. It's a place of weeping. And we cannot journey through life without encountering that because it, it is the nature uh, of life. And life has its very high moments and life has its low moments. I call it the peak and the pits. And what you have to learn to do, 
What I had to learn to do is to understand the God of the high moments is just as powerful in the low moments as he is in the high moment. The God of the mountains is the God of the valleys. And you have to learn to uh, embrace God that way. That, that God is, is walking with me in this time of weeping. And in this time of weeping, we go from strength to strength. And we have to understand endurance that way. We are going from strength to strength. And I call this uh, the victory of inching along. You remember Joshua was told by God to take the promised land. And in the first chapter of Joshua, God said to him, every place you put your foot, I'm going to give it to you. And you read the rest of Joshua. He fought in the hills, the valleys, the cities, the fields. And everywhere he put his foot, God gave it to him. And God wants you to know you have to put your foot on something. And I call it the victory of just inching along. If yesterday was pure hell, thank God you're still alive and you're an inch further toward the end than you were yesterday. There's a lot of victory in the inch. Just talk to a football team. They win it 10 yards at a time. And they inch along. Watch the Olympic Games, won by fractions of a second. And, and there's just this place in life where we just inch along, and there's victory in the inch. I broke my ankle in 216. I cracked my elbow. I fell. I spent nine weeks in a wheelchair in a rehab center because I could not walk. My one leg was in a cast, an elbow was in a cast. The whole left side of my body was useless. And I sat in a wheelchair for nine weeks. And I learned to appreciate the victory of inching along. And I decided uh, I, God might not give me an instant miracle, but every day I was gonna inch toward victory. And I learned to get out of a wheelchair and stand on one leg. I learned to do what they call pivoting, which is twirl myself around on one leg and sit from the wheelchair to a chair. And then I learned to walk with a boot. I learned to walk with a walker. And here I am totally healed today. And I inched my way toward victory. You inch your way toward victory. And every day, I saw myself one step nearer to getting out of that wheelchair. And you have to vision that, that your time in the valley of weeping is endured that way. Length of time does not mean a disaster. Uh, an inch is a victory. I feel like there are many of you that are an inch closer today than you were yesterday. So thank God for that victory. You showed up this morning. You're, as Phil said, still here. Still here. Inching along. And the last thing that I want to say is Hebrews 12, verse 2. And it is about the focus. Hebrews 12, 2 says, we look unto Jesus. Now, hear, hear how Jesus is called here. The author and the finisher of our faith. He wants to author something. He wants to finish something in all of us. Endurance lets us make that journey. Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, disregarded its shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, Jesus had to keep his focus. He endured the cross because in his understanding, the cross was not the end. The cross was not the final word. It was painful. It was horrible. He had to endure, I think, six-something hours 
on the cross, but he looked beyond the cross to, to the promise of the Father that he would leave the throne of God, he would come to earth, he would suffer, he would die, he would be resurrected on the third day, and he would return to the throne of God, which is where he is today. And Jesus had to focus on that. Psalm 30, verse 5, says, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And every nighttime ends with the morning. And you may weep in a night, but you have to stay focused. You have to take a long view. You have to give that long view to God and realize that where you are today is not where you're going to stay. You will endure, and one day you're going to run smack dab into everything that God has promised you. And you're going to come to the end, and you're going to be uh, a finisher. I like Jean, my husband's long view. Every time I say to Jean, what in the world do you think is going on? What are we going to do? Jean quotes Matthew 6 to me. He says, June, uh, God tells me he takes care of the birds, and I've never seen a worried bird, so I'm not going to worry about this. He said, I, I just know God's going to take care of us. And here's what Gene always says to me. Everything is going to be all right. Yes. And I like Gene's long view. So years ago, this was back in the 70s, as I, I told you, we are graduates of the University of Alabama, and we always watch Alabama play football on TV. Sometimes we go to the games if we can. So this is back in the 70s. We lived in South Georgia. This is before you could tape. This is before we had uh, internet and media like we do today. And uh, Alabama's game had not been broadcast on any television show we could watch. And they announced that at 11 o'clock on Saturday night, uh, this, this sports channel would broadcast the Alabama game that was played on Saturday afternoon. So Gene said to me, you want to sit up and watch Alabama play football? I said, yeah, we'll do it. So 11 o'clock at night, we're in bed, we're watching the TV. We have it turned to the Alabama game. Now during our day, we had seen the score of the Alabama game. So we knew they won because we had seen the score go across the bottom of the screen. So we watched the first quarter. In the first quarter, the score was 21 to nothing. The opposing team was 21, Alabama was nothing. And Gene has to preach the next morning. It's going toward midnight. And Gene looked at me and he said, you know, I've got to get up and preach in the morning. And he said, I don't think we need to watch this game because we know how it's going to end. Alabama wins. And we turned the TV off and we went to bed. And I want to say to you this morning, the score may be devil 21 and you're nothing, but the game's not over yet. You stay in the game because you and God are finishers. You're going to win in Jesus' name. Now, if you're in a negative place and you need strength and power to endure, would you stand to your feet right now? And I'm going to pray for you. You're just going through stuff. Just stand where you are. If you're near some of your brothers and sisters, just pray with us. You're going through something. You need help. It's tough. You need God to speak to you. You need God to help you. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters that are standing we thank you that the score may look very negative, but you're going to give them this day the strength and the power of endurance. You're going to enable them to walk forward with a vision, with a hope, holding on to their confidence in you. We thank you, God, for the way you're going to work. 
Uh, we thank you. There's going to be testimonies from our brothers and sisters, and they're going to come and tell us that they have made it to the finish. Now, would the rest of you stand up? I want you to lay hands on yourselves. Uh, we, we're going to bring this to a conclusion. Our elders are going to be here to pray for you. Uh, I will be here to pray for you. And as, as we are dismissed, I want us to hold on to our confidence in God. I want us to renew our confidence in God. I want the power and the strength of endurance to work in your lives so that if Jesus tarries when you're in your 80s, you will have the testimony of longevity with God. Now, Lord, our goal here is to do life with you. That's why we're in church this morning. We want to do life with the Holy Spirit. We want to do life with your Bible. We want to do life the way you want it done. And I pray that the goal for every person in this room that you have established, O oh God, that those goals will be attained, that everything that needs to be done will be done, and nothing will be left out or wanting. And I pray now for the strength and the power of God to enable everyone here to endure and to the end. Help us next week, God. We give you the praise, the power, and the glory as we walk through life with you. In Jesus' name, amen.